So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio and for my YouTube channel. And uh, I'm super excited that my guest is the fantastic Richard McCourt, aka Dick from Dick and Dom. How are you, Richard? Hello, very well, thanks. Yeah, good to, good to be here. Good to see you. I mean, all very strange from your spare room, it looks like, and from my kitchen. <laughs> it's the world we find ourselves in now. Everyone's having to do everything from home, which is, is easier for, for travel. We don't have to obviously travel very far. Um, but obviously, since this whole situation kicked off last, last March, how have you found just, the, the, you know, life, work? How, how has it all been for you? Well, I mean, work-wise, probably was, has been the most difficult part because, um, you know, a lot of our work at the moment is, is live work, you know, doing festivals or DJ gigs, uh, theatre shows, you know, we've done the Edinburgh Festival in the past, stuff like that. Um, so all of that was just cancelled. Last March, the diary literally just got wiped clean. So we've, what we've had to do is find a new way of working, like, I mean, what you're doing now online with these interviews. Uh, and it's been, yeah, it's been difficult trying to kind of change. What we've done is, let's take the example of the DJ gigs we usually do at student unis. We now do them online. So, you know, me and Dom in, uh, in, in his house, we've set up some decks, uh, we plug in, and all the students now come onto Zoom. So it's, it's still a party atmosphere, but it's just finding those ways of being able to do the same job, but in a, in, in a different way, you know. Uh, Life-wise, yeah, I mean, it's just... <laughs> I think we're all bored now, really bored now, aren't we? We've, we've all had enough of it. I mean, it's been a horrible, horrible situation for millions of people. But um, let's just, you know, fingers crossed, let's just hope it all kind of comes to an end soon. I mean, in the early days of the first lockdown, did you find yourself mm. doing other things like learning skills? Like, I know a lot of people have been sort of baking, gardening, all that sort of stuff. I know. I mean... I, I was going more on the, you know, the quotes people were putting out. Look, don't put pressure on yourself. You don't have to suddenly go and bake a banana bread. You don't have to suddenly learn a language, all this kind of thing. So I, I kind of tried to keep it quite chilled. You know, I didn't put too much pressure on myself going, oh, I've got to fill my time with this, that and the other. Watched a lot of Netflix, obviously. Uh, <laughs> i tell you one, one thing I've enjoyed doing is I never really watched the Marvel films when they first came out. So I've watched them all in the correct order. I think I've got one left to watch now. So... Uh, yeah, I've, I've just tried to do things, you know, to fill the time. I mean, we've been working remotely uh, mainly, so it's all on the emails and, and doing interviews like this online. And yeah, I mean, just filling the days with whatever you can. I've been trying to do as much exercise as possible. I think that's a, a good thing, you know, when, you, when you're stuck in the house all day, just get outside, go for a walk, even if it's for a 10 minute walk, you know. That's the, other, like that that's the other thing is obviously mental health is so important and you know this is yeah, the time right. that people can can sort of slip down that slippery slope so they need to kind of keep oh. themselves active but also not stress themselves out well I, I know and i think for a lot of people in our industry unfortunately you know I, a lot of friends of mine are actors and people in the theater and and other live performers and you know yeah we've had some they've had some hard days um you know kind of getting a bit depressed about it all because the, because there's no timeline i suppose you know you don't know when it's going to come back. So if you, if you had a date in mind, you'd kind of go, okay, yeah, okay, I can chill out for a couple of months and then I'll go back to work. But for some of these people, you know, actors in theatres, that was their livelihood. And now they're finding themselves literally with nothing. I mean, you know, what, what do you do when you're trained in one specific art? I mean, how do you suddenly go and be an Amazon delivery driver? I mean, I know people that have done that. One of my friends became a boots driver for a bit, you know, delivering medicine around the country. But you know, you have to do what you have to do, don't you? You know, and obviously, you know, uh, being in a double act, having uh, Dominic about, I imagine for the two of you, you obviously, you know, you kept in contact through the whole thing, and obviously, getting oh, yeah. back to work together must have been nice to, to get back yeah. to a bit more normality. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky in that respect. I mean, that's why we've always enjoyed being in a double act, actually, for 25 years this year, which is mad to think. Um, but you know, you, yeah, you've always got someone to share the stress or the you know, kind of workload with, it's not just you on your own, kind of, you know working out what to do me and Dom are always in yeah we're in conversation every single day so you know we're talking about you know this job that job what we're going to do next um so yeah I think being in a double act during this lockdown has probably uh, has probably been very beneficial now I didn't actually realize this until until we actually got in uh, first got into conversation was you started out in hospital radio so I mean oh, for yeah. you where, where did the interest for you know broadcasting and for 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 you know doing the job you do where did that first come from just used to watch loads of kids TV. 
you know, CBB, Children's BBC when Philip Schofield was in the broom cupboard. You know, now most people, younger people now, I'll only know him from this morning, but he used to do kids' TV when I was a kid, you know. Um, Wider Weight Club on TVAM on ITV. Low, just, I just binge watched children's TV. So I started thinking in the back of my mind, well, actually, it was my brother first. He, my brother James, uh, he started getting so into it that he started like writing to places like, you know, TVAM and stuff and getting signed pictures of all the presenters and stuff. And then he stick them on his wall. And being his younger brother, you know, I was looking up to him going, actually, this is, yeah, this is quite exciting. And he always wanted to kind of be a children's presenter. And I kind of followed in his footstep, footsteps, I suppose. Uh, he then went on to uh, work on the Disney Channel for many years. They used to do links in between the programs on there. So he was doing that while I got the job at Children's BBC doing the links there. But yeah, I started in hospital radio when I was 12. So I think at the time I was the youngest DJ in the country. I had a really high pitched voice like that because my voice hadn't broken. So <laughs> luckily mean- there's no uh, there's no tapes of it anywhere. So uh, <laughs> do you remember the first time you sat in front of a mic and how you were feeling before you went live? Oh yeah, I mean I, I, I can kind of remember. I, what I had to do was you know we do demo tapes back in the day where you know you kind of send it into the hospital radio station to try and get a job there. And I remember I had to do it at home on a proper old school tape recorder. And I think, yeah, I suppose, I suppose the first thing that comes into your head is, uh, what do I say? You know, because radio, you've just got to constantly keep talking, talking, you know. Um, so I think I wrote a little script out of, I don't know, it was like a, a news report or a weather report or something for the local area and just kind of read it and, uh, and went from there. But yeah, radio can be scary in that uh, respect because, you know, it's just nonstop. It's all about you talking constantly. But I, I loved it. I loved it. I was there for many years at hospital radio and, and that kind of... You know, I gained all the experience that I could and uh, then went on to work at the BBC. So uh, it all came good. And I mean, where did you first meet? Do you remember the first time you met Dom? I mean, how did you become you yes. know, the, the partnership you are today? Oh, funny you should say that because I found a photo uh, this morning. Let me just get it on my, uh, I'll put it up for you, uh, of where we met. This is in BBC TV Centre and it's the Green Tea Bar. Oh wow! <laughs> this photo is funny because we met just here by this till <laughs> in the green tea bar at TV Centre. Because this this green this tea bar here used to do bacon sandwiches in the morning. That's all they would serve, just bacon sandwiches, tea, and coffee. So I think we were both down there getting a, a breakfast roll and um, started chatting. All right, mate, because I knew he'd started at the same age I'd started, and I was like, "All right, mate, where are you where are you from?" He said Exeter. I was talking about Sheffield, you know. And we just started having some banter and then starting to get along. And then, you know, do you want to go out for a beer later? Yeah. And it kind of started from there. But yes, the green tea bar at TV Centre. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was, it, was it from the, the get-go? Were you always close? Were you always such good friends? I mean, or did it take a bit of time to get to know each other? No, it was one of those, yeah, kind of meant to be moments, I suppose, as you would say in a, you know, loving relationship. It was just like kind of, Hello, mate. Yeah, you all right? Yeah, you all right? And we just got on like a house on fire straight away. And then, and then I'd, uh, uh, I was in a house share at the time and someone in my house share moved out. And Don was in a bit of a, uh, you know, trying to find somewhere to live. So I said, do you want to move into the house share? And then next minute we shared, yeah, we shared flats for about six years together. So that was absolute carnage. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember the first time you actually worked together on a, on a project and how, how it all came about? Yeah, it was on a children's BBC breakfast show. So we were doing the links in between the, you know, broom covered bits in between the programs. Um, so it was like a 7 a.m. And um, it was, I'm sure it was a sketch with a, a rubber chicken, I think. <laughs> Dom, Dom does magic, you know, not a lot, not a lot of people know, but Dom, Dom's a magician. So he started uh, doing the links, but doing magic in the links. So I think it was something to do with a, a rubber chicken and a magic trick, yeah. It's many years ago. <laughs> it was 25 years ago. So, uh, and of course, the, the, you know, the big project that many people will remember, and I mean, I used to love watching it, was obviously Dick and Dom in the bungalow. For yes. you, how, I mean, that is such a, 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 it's a, it's a strange concept because to, to kind of talk through it, I imagine to people, mm. maybe they don't get it initially, but to watch it, it then makes so much sense because it is just silliness. So, so where did the idea come from for that show? Well, it, it started off because the CBBC, CBBC channel had launched, um, but they, they kind of then looked at the schedule and went, oh, wow, we've got to fill, I don't know, it was on from 7 eight in the morning until 6 at night. We've got all this time to fill. So they started repeating a lot of programmes and making new programmes as well. But at the weekends, they felt they needed something just to kind of, 
you know, fill the gap from like nine until 12. So the bungalow started, uh, well, the, the, the name came first. Uh, it was a dinner party. All the bosses were together. And they said, oh, it'd be nice to do something with Dick and Dom mate, on the mornings, maybe. Uh, and one of them said, what about something like, you know, because they share a flat together. Why don't you call it something like Dick and Dom in the house or Dick and Dom in the flat, you know? Um, and I think that they had a few more drinks and, and then someone shouted out, no, I've got it. Dick and Dom in da, because I think it was around the time of Ali G, you know, mm. when in da was kind of the thing. Um, Dick and Dom in da bungalow. So the name came first and then the producer, we've got, had a, an amazing producer called Steve Ride. Ride and um, he then started kind of to produce what the bungalow would be and it went from there. So it was basically just to fill time at first. I don't think anybody really thought it was going to take off like it did. Um, but, you know, one week we'd get 5,000 viewers, the next week 10,000. Before you know it, we're on 250,000 viewers. And, you know, for a new channel, that was amazing. So then BBC One went, ah, OK, I think we need this on the main channel now. You know, it's so popular. And I mean, it, yeah, had so, so, it, it had so many great features. I mean, obviously, everyone used to love the, you know, Bogies playing that game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Diddy Dick and Dom as well, which, you know, was just yeah. hysterical. I mean, wh when you're planning out what's going to go into the show, how, I mean, how do you decide what to put in and what not to put in? Well, yeah, I mean, as you know, it was a three hour uh, live show. So there was a lot of time to fill. Um, it, it was just, it was great. It was a great team of people. It was great teamwork. You know, the producer, is a genius and he came up with a lot of the stuff like bogeys and diddy dick and dom and, well the whole look of the of the show really uh and then there was just a great team around it and they would literally spend week after week just coming up with new ideas new games and just filling the gaps you know i think i remember there was a whiteboard in the office and it just used to have all the names of all the games you know and you could just pick one out at any time you needed it just to fill those three hours i mean we had cartoons in there as well and animations and stuff um but yeah, it was just, it was a bit of a free for all. So that's what, I think that's, that was the beauty of it. You know, it was all very off the cuff. Um, so we'd get a script, but it wasn't like, now you've got to say this, now you've got to say that. It was just format points really, you know, now time for bogeys, now Diddy Dick and Dom. And then we'd just roll with it really and, and see what happened, you know, it was, uh, it was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine when you're like recording the, the, the obviously the, you know, the games like bogeys and stuff, because obviously a lot of those were done in public places and you're playing yeah. it with people, I'm guessing, who had no idea what you were doing. So that must have been a little bit daunting as well. Well, yeah, it was. I remember the first ever bogeys, I think it was in Madame Tussauds. So we went straight in at the deep end and um, obviously Madame Tussauds, there's lots of foreign tourists as well in London. And they hadn't got a clue. They didn't even understand what the word meant, you know, but they could just see two men walking around screaming. And like, <laughs> but then, it, you know, it just took off from there. There was something about it that, you know, I mean, great catchphrase for one, but for two, it was just so wrong, wasn't it? It was so naughty at the time, you know. Two grown men walking into a, a library shouting bogeys is, uh, <laughs> is, is more the reaction of the other people. That that's, was the beauty of bogeys, I think, the reactions of the, the public. And then the other game I mean, that you, I was going to say, the other game that you played, which was um, a lot of fun, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was where you had photos of each other and you were trying to get like little, oh, yeah. and it would get bigger and bigger. The photos, you'd try and put them onto people's backs. I was just going to say, if anyone listening uh, didn't know what bogeys was or doesn't remember it, it was basically a game where we go into somewhere quiet, like a museum or a library, and then take it in turns to shout bogeys, getting louder and louder and louder. And the person that wins is the person that doesn't bottle out or shouts at the loudest. So anyway, they know now what bogeys is. But yeah, the other game we played, which kind of took over from bogeys, was uh, Eeny Meeny Macaraka, Rara Dominaka, Shiggy Popper Dicky Wopper on Pom Stick. Uh, don't ask me who came up with that title, I can't remember. Uh, probably Steve. Uh, and yes, we'd go round the, the, to different cities and um, we'd start off with little stickers of our faces, me and Dom, so we were challenging each other. And then the, the, the stickers of our faces would get bigger and bigger and bigger until they were gigantic. I mean, you're talking kind of seven foot tall stickers. <laughs> and I think once we got to the biggest sticker and we stuck it on the back of an old granny, I think she nearly toppled over. Um, but actually, I don't know. Sometimes I think, do I actually find that one funnier than bogeys? I, I can't, I really enjoyed playing that game. There's just something about, it's such an old fashioned, you know, kind of parlor game, isn't it? Sticking something on someone's back, but there's just something, you know, some beauty about it. People not know. I actually don't want stuck a sticker on someone's front <laughs> and, they, and they didn't notice. There's a great clip of it online somewhere. Yeah. He actually, he kind of did some misdirection, like some magic and, um, yeah, whacked this sticker on this bloke's front and the bloke never looked down, didn't even feel it. So he walked off with a big sticker of Dom's face 
on his chest. <laughs> I mean, do you ever have to, after doing those games, did you ever have to kind of go and say to the people afterwards, thank you for being part of it and, and all that? Or, or was it kind of like, once it was done, it was done and you never saw them again? Well, we were, you know, it was a different kind of time then, wasn't it? I think nowadays you probably have loads of forms to fill in and, you know, kind of all that business. But now, but back then it was, um, it was easier. You know, people just wanted to, you know, if they, if you told them you, you're going to be on TV, they were like, oh, wow, yeah, you know, that's, you just needed kind of them to say yes. I don't, and I don't think a lot of the time we asked for permission, no, unless something went horribly wrong. I think once we were thrown out of a, um, a museum in Italy, because we played a, a, a European game of bogeys. So we'd go to different European cities to play it. And um, in Italy, I think the word was mocho or something. So we walked around this museum shouting this word for bogeys, mocho. And uh, yeah, the security guards, didn't take too well to it and uh, and kicked us out. So yeah, sometimes it went a bit wrong. <laughs> now, obviously, the, the the show also launched the careers of people like Melvin O'Doom, who's obviously gone on to do things like Strictly and everything. So getting to work with all these different people as well must have been fun. Um, and also getting gunged must have been a bit interesting. <laughs> we it's funny we were doing a, uh, a, a an article for a magazine the other day about being gunged. Uh, but in the bungalow, uh, in this article, the answers we were given were saying in the bungalow, it wasn't really gunge, it was, we called it creamy muck muck. Um, but it didn't have the same consistency as, say, gunge you would have seen on, like, Noel's house party or something. Our gunge was just, well, ambrosia custard, basically. So we just used tons. I mean, oh, I can't remember, there's a statistic somewhere. Over the four years of the show, we used, like, a ton of custard or something. And it was just packets and packets of the buckets of this stuff we'd lob about. Uh, but, and you'd find it in your ear, solidified about two weeks later. It would go hard. If we didn't use custard, we'd use baked beans, mushy peas, chopped tomatoes, <laughs> anything you could get your hands on food-wise. Um, so, yeah, no, gunging, gunging was great fun, you know, but um, I'm glad I don't do it anymore, to be honest. <laughs> I was going to say, was there ever a time that you just kind of thought, oh, not again, I don't want to do this again? <laughs> Uh, there was one game we used to play, a bit like the sticker game and the bogeys game, where we'd go out on the street. It was called Dick and Don's Dirty Day. And we'd be dressed in white overalls. And the idea of the game was um, to get as dirty as possible. So you'd literally walk past someone drinking a cappuccino or something and say, can you throw that at me, please? Or someone in a cafe uh, and just shouting, excuse me, can you squirt me with brown sauce? And they'd just literally stand at the door and cover you in brown sauce. Uh, but sometimes we filmed that, it was like minus two or something in the winter and, you know, you're covered in like mud and brown sauce and coffee and you just think, yeah, I don't know whether I, I might just want to go home now and have a bath, I think. So, yeah, sometimes it was, it was a bit um, like, you know, something you didn't really want to do. Do you think ever in the future it would come back, obviously once we're, you know, life is back to normal, hmm. do you think it would ever come back as a, as a concept? Well, I wish it, I wish it would, and I, or you know, and I wish there were were Saturday morning programmes still, but you don't really get that kind of TV anymore, do you? I think the bungalow, you probably, the thing with it, you wouldn't be allowed to do a lot of that anymore. The rule book in TV has changed over since two thousand and six, and you know, it's so much bigger now. The rule book that, yeah, I think you'd take away the heart of the programme nowadays because you'd they'd go, no, you can't do that. You probably wouldn't even get away with bogeys anymore, you know. So I think. You'd, you wouldn't want to put down a watered-down version of it, you know. I mean, we've got some plans in the pipeline for something next year, but I can't tell you about it just yet, to do with the bungalow. But I think it going back on TV, mm, probably not. I mean, obviously, going forward, you know, we know that, you know, the future hopefully will get better by the end of the year. But I imagine that you yeah. just want to get back out on the road doing live oh. stuff with, with oh, Dom right. again. Yeah, I mean, you know, we... we changed up some of our things like i said dj gigs we've now started doing them online you know on zoom so you can see we do student uni so you can see all the students online and everyone's having a great time at a party but it's just not the same as being out there at a festival on stage or in a theater doing a live show you know oh yeah you miss the buzz of the crowd and everything and i think people are missing it too they want to go and see live entertainment again they want to go to the theater they want to go to a club they want to see a dj gig you know so, fingers crossed, it'll be this year, but, you know, who knows, it could be next year till we see any of that again. And we must, yeah, just, give a, we must just give a quick mention, of, of course, to the amazing frontline workers, the, the mm. NHS staff. I mean, what, what's your kind of, what, what have you, you know, kind of come to take from the amazing work they do? How, how have you sort of found well, it? Like you say, the word that you've used there, they are amazing. I mean, you know, you read some of these articles that are... Yeah, I mean, it's just, you can't imagine what it's like to be in the, you know, on the front line during this, you know, in, especially when we've been in some of the peaks and you just see them 
battling away, working all hours. You know, they're absolutely exhausted, some of them. You know, I mean, I'm not a political person, but, you know, you do think, oh, come on, why are they not getting paid more than they are? You know, these are, these are the most important people in the country, especially at the moment. You know, you see other people who are millionaires that are, you know, doing a whatever job and they're still only getting paid minimum wage. And, oh, I don't know, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a horrible situation. But, yes, amazing is the word. They are amazing people. And it does, you know, I think the whole, the, the whole work, you know, country has a newfound respect. Not, not that we didn't love them before, but I think yeah. maybe they got, you know, forgotten about a bit. So they've come back to the forefront. And I think now is the perfect time that, you know, yeah, we, we keep on doing our bit to help them. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, and I think, you know, a massive percentage of the country has been, uh, you know, following the rules. They're just uh, the odd one or two people that have decided, you know, coronavirus is not for them and uh, they, they haven't worn a face mask and they've not been social distancing but you know you can't make everyone do everything but let's just hope that everyone has this vaccine and we can start getting back to normal over the next year fingers crossed and I mean for anyone who's currently in hospital at the moment have you got any messages for them mm. that's funny because yeah like I say I used to do hospital radio so I used to go around the wards and collect requests you know uh, which song do you want playing tonight but yeah um just, uh, I suppose one that always comes to mind is um, when I was doing hospital radio, when I was 12, I used to write off to loads of different people, you know, that were on TV or radio and ask them to do little jingles for me. And one of them that got back was Philip Schofield, actually. And he, he did a little jingle for me and he kind of said, you're listening to Richard McCourt on Sheffield Children's Hospital Radio. And, and I always remember at the end, he did a little tagline. He went, get well soon. And that's an order. <laughs> no, yeah there you go there's my message from philip schofield all those years ago get well soon that's an order now i just want to say richard it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you of course thank you for for giving up your time you. um you know no keep keep safe and uh yeah hopefully we'll speak again soon well fingers crossed and yeah let's hope we all get uh, back to a bit of normality and hello to everyone in, is it reading yeah reading isn't it hello to everyone in reading in the hospital but keep up the keep up the good work you do because uh yeah, I mean, hospital radio is a great thing when you, I remember when I was doing it, you know, people loved listening to hospital, because when, when you're in the hospital and the, the station's there as well, it becomes one, doesn't it? You know, you feel part of it. Thank so, you so uh, much. keep doing it.